Potions World Citizen Book Club. Today is Saturday, August 10th, and I am your moderator, James May. I am a program officer at CGS. Um, I'm pleased to see uh, you're all here today. Welcome. If this is anyone's first time at Book Club, a special welcome to you. Um, if it is your first time and you'd like to be kept informed about upcoming Book Club sessions, please drop a message in the chat and we'll add you to our mail group. Um, Dre is monitoring the chat, uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to her or post questions in the general chat if you have them. Today we continue uh, with the book Unraveled, A Personal Journey into Conflict, War and Diplomacy by Dr. Emma Onsong, Osong, sorry, uh, uh, who joins us today. Today is the first, uh, the second of two sessions uh, on Dr. Osong's book. Um, in the last so sec uh, session, uh, in July, Dr. Osong gave us a fascinating introduction to the situation in Cameroon, and in particular, the independence movement of uh, the Southern Cameroons, an English-speaking area in the northwest of Cameroon, including the circumstances in which uh, Southern Cameroons became a part of Cameroon, and the political machinations that have uh, sought to keep them there since it was incorporated in 1961, uh, which occurred without a legal treaty of union. Dr. Osong has argued that uh, for there to be peace, conflict must be resolved and injustices addressed. I will come back to Dr. Osong to take us through the second session on her book uh, after a little housekeeping. So first of all, we're recording today's session. The, the video will be available on CGS's YouTube channel by mid next week. Uh, to ensure there is enough time for everyone to ask questions, which will come up after we, uh, Dr. Osong has had an opportunity to present the book, um, I'm going to set a community agreement and ask you to keep your questions or comments to just two minutes. If you uh, exceed that time, I will interject and ask you to wrap up so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. I'm also going to ask you to limit yourself to just one question uh, or one comment per person. Um, as I've said, we want everyone to we want to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to engage with Dr. Osong. Does anyone object to this community agreement? Okay, great. Uh, the schedule for today's session will be uh, similar to our usual setup. Uh, Dr. Osong will kick us off with her thoughts about the ch chapters covered uh, today uh, from her book. Uh, we will then open up to questions around 12.30. Um, you can raise your hands virtually or physically or put questions in the chat. Um, I'll come to first uh, to you on a first come first serve basis. We'll then stop about 10 minutes before the end at around tw uh, 1 20 um, for any announcements that you'd like to make about other issues not related to book club, uh, which we do most uh, sessions. Uh, please hold those cons uh, comments that aren't about the book until that uh, end of session uh, period. Um, so uh, with that, now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest author for today, Dr. Emma Osong. Uh, Dr. Osong was founder of the Women for Permanent Peace and Justice and is an engineer in aerospace and aviation systems. She is the author of today's book, Unraveled a Personal Journey into Conflict, War and Diplomacy. Uh, today is session two on Dr. Osong's book. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Osong to take us through the next chapters. Thank you, James, for that kind introduction. And again, I'm so happy to see some new faces in this session uh, that we missed the last time. And I'm really, really looking forward to an interesting afternoon. Um, it takes a lot. Um, so your time, uh, I value your time that you're taking out of um, your perfect Saturday afternoon. So with that, James gave a few opening remarks on what I treated in Unravel the last time, uh, if you haven't had my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so in se session one, I did what I call an inspectional read, uh, where I established that the um, there, there, is, there are historical root uh, causes around what is today called an eight-year war of, of uh, secession. In, in an area of Africa called Cameroon, and more specifically in what has been known by all different types of uh, names, Southern Cameroon, former British Southern Cameroon, the Anglophone region, the Northwest and Southwest of Cameroon, and, and a whole other plethora of names. Uh, I, ex I attempted in the first session to establish what I felt were the root causes and uh, what today has led to what has been described as a genocide in making for some people, um, where thousands have been killed, almost a million displaced, um, and just a lot of violence on civilians. I also, in the first session, 
uh, related my own awakening as to how I describe as coming to be called first a Cameroonian and today uh, an American of Southern Cameroon descent. Um, again, uh, I, I went into some length to, to, to share that awakening in session one and what I detailed in Unraveled. I also touched on some of the sensitivities around my, my what I've come to call justice advocacy for my daughter first, for my daughter and now for a larger population of people who need justice and accountability. So in that session, we established that UN principles for self-determination and equality of all countries under colonial rule meant that these colonies could not be governed into perpetuity, but rather the administrative authorities needed to move each of their colonies into self-governance or outright independence. However, I established in, in, in the first session that when it came to parts of Africa, that movement into self-reliance, self-governance, independence was fraught with a lot of complications. And uh, hence the, the most complex of them in Sub-Saharan Africa being that of the former British Southern Cameroons uh, movement uh, into independence. So we established that uh, countries, administrative countries like France just never left till today. Others like Great Britain were all too willing to leave um, and could care less what arrangement they left behind for their territories. Hence, you, you hear and read on literature about the botch decolonization processes, as in the case of Southern Cameroons. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, and reminded the audience that uh, the root causes of what has been called um, the war in Cameroon really comes from the claims of uh, sovereignty by the government of La République du Cameroon or Cameroon as most people call it over this part called Southern Cameroons, which is today called Northwest, Southwest Anglophone territories. And these claims were based on the false history, which I went to some details to, to uh, talk about and also to detail in the book and false claims of application of law and resolutions. United, uh, international resolutions, most specifically uh, 60, resolution 1608, the Africa Constitutive Act, as well as uh, the Republic of Cameroon's own constitution. I would leave it at that as a summary to kind of just um, bring us into uh, where we are on, with the second half of Unravel starting on uh, uh, chapter seven uh, to chapter 11. So in this second half, um, 7 to 11, I will summarize it with one statement, uh, my accounts that is, that is um, an attempt to show how justice and accountability has been systematically delayed or denied for the people of Southern Cameroons. So if I were to ask how I summarize the last half of my book, it would be that it will also include my own representation of what I see as the peace and security landscape uh, for the most part in Sub-Saharan Africa, most specifically for uh, the construct called Cameroon, the complex set of actors that are currently engaged in the country by way of governance and now by way of actors in the full theater of war, their proxies with France looming large, the competing agendas therein, Again, uh, the geopolitical arena, right? Um, the last half of the book, I deal with the concept uh, that I could simply uh, describe as the prioritization of profits over humanity, uh, wherein I talk of, um, again, competing agendas, contradictions in terms of the country Cameroon vis-a-vis -vis its position in the world and um, internally, it, it's political, social, and economic contradictions. Um, I detail to some extent my bird's eye view 
as an active actor engage with some unsavory characters. Uh, by this, I mean uh, both the armed groups, separatists fighting for independence of the country Amazonia, which is now called Amazonia, and government operatives, and the hyperfragmentation on both sides within the armed groups as well as within the, um, the government. And, and again, uh, my role in uh, two failed peace processes. So for today, what I hope to do, instead of an inspection I'll read as I did the last time, what I'd like to do is attempt what I call a thematic discussion. I thought long and hard about this because the last part that deals with peace processes that never went anywhere, hyperfragmentation and competing agenda is very, very rich and detailed in terms of the literature out there. And any attempts in the time we have today to really treat each chapter is going to be very long. So my hope is that a thematic discussion where I'll talk about the peace and security landscape with my understanding of it um, in the context of the theater of war of South, uh, Southern Cameroons, my role in peace processes and what we can do to really bring about lasting peace would be a better thematic approach than an inspection or read and might generate conversation and questions, which is I hope for this afternoon in a book discussion. So if you agree with that approach, I'm going to do my darnest, talk as fast as I can, because again, there are lots of competing thoughts in my head because dear friends, I have been immersed in the process and therefore there's so much I want to share out of my passion and out of my desire to see audiences that are coming new into this process to get and understand and my desire to win friends for the march towards peace and justice. So let me begin with this concept of, take a breath, Emma, <laughs> peace and security and the resolution of conflicts um, as the first thematic area that I wanna deal with. Uh, and I begin in a place that's very current. So this past week, uh, Sierra Leone became the president of the UN Security Council and uh, held a press conference to announce that fact. Uh, a reporter asked a question about the war in South Sudan and what skills and competency did the ambassador uh, Kano bring into the UN Security Council? And the gentleman resp response was that, we are going to focus on cessation of hostilities in the world. We're going to use good faith dialogue as a method of resolving conflict, and we're going to apply the UN Charter. So he leaned very heavily on established UN principles, which brings me to share with you, friends, that the UN Charter says parties to a dispute that is likely to engender the peace and security of the world should seek all these methods of resolving their conflict up and including mediation, negotiations, and any other ADRs, that is alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, and regional bodies. Um, why do I bring this up, this very current thing, uh, as it relates to unravels? It's because the reality, as I, I detail in unravel, is that we have seen that the international human rights law is often skewed to protect criminal conduct when those conducts are done in service of agents of mostly the West. I know that's a vast um, broad strokes, right, of accusation, but that's what we see happening today. Hence the concept of double standards. The examples are really there for us to see. Russia in Ukraine, China in Taiwan, North Korea um, with South Korea, uh, Israel in Gaza, Iran as the nemesis of the West. And today, just a few weeks ago, we saw the uh, Assistant Secretary of State Lloyd Austin deploy the uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier into the region, ostensibly from threats from Iran. Uh, we've also seen the ICC uh, Prosecutor Karen Khan going to Ukraine to investigate, to Gaza to investigate uh, war crimes. Now, why is this important? And in, in, in relation to unravel, 
we can reasonably conclude, just like in southern Cameroons, that the world is and its superpowers, right, are either planning for war or are engaged in some kind of civil war, and the rest of the world are mandated to participate in. So the question is, does the world even have a bandwidth to deal with civil wars occurring in places like Cameroon in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? Do they have a bandwidth to go out and investigate war crimes and crimes against uh, humanity, which are international crimes? That's the operative question that I, I keep raising throughout my um, book, Unravel. So the situation in what is today called Ambazonia by the armed separatists is that crimes, international crimes have been committed and they warrant international response. And I look at that through the lens of the current war in, um, in, in Southern Cameroons. So I draw the reader's attention to this. And I also tease out for our purposes here, some more contemporaneous um, discussion. Just uh, two years ago in 2022, uh, 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 an article from New Line Institute and the Ra Raoul Wallenberg Institute mm -hmm. was published that simply said, Russia has committed genocide in Ukraine. And this decided among many things, mass killings, the indiscriminate uh, bombardment of civilian settlement, the imposing of conditions that threatens life, uh, denial of access to humanitarian um, assistance, using rape as a tool of war. Why am I listing all of this? It's simply, as I write in Unravel, that, and, and as I shared uh, when I had the pleasure of meeting um, Rebecca at the Assembly of States Party at the United Nations, that new, there have been numerous credible uh, reports and allegations that war crimes and crimes against humanity mm. has been committed in what is described by some as a genocidal war in Southern Cameroon. Yet, the international community is largely failing to act in spite of these, these evidence um, and that there's a need for humanitarian assistance. So we see what we see, and I, I share in the book, are statements, thoughts, and prayers, right? To the UN's credit, uh, particularly Antonio Guterres, he's on record to call for ceasefire between the government of Cameroon and the armed uh, separatist groups fighting. He's on record calling for swift investigations of this crime. He's on record uh, saying he supports an inclusive dialogue and the UN will throw its weight behind, which I'll, I will speak on this when I talk about the peace process a little bit more. But the reason I bring that here is, um, I share that these are mainly statements, thoughts and prayers, and they end there, as opposed to active actions that actually ends the war or uh, brings about uh, accountability. So uh, to end this section, I say that we can safely conclude that one of the challenges we face is the lack of justice and fairness in some parts of the world. And Unravel, my, my um, exposition in Unravel is to tease this out within the war that I know uh, for myself best, which is the war raging in my birth country. In the interest of time, I'll stop there and move to um, the section that I call uh, prioritizing profits over humanity. And within this thematic area, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at a number of things. Uh, the contradiction inherent in the construct Cameroon um, and some of the uh, uh, competing agendas and the hyperfragmentation that is growing each day as the war persists. 
I, I opened this section in Unravel by, by quoting uh, John Lewis, the lead uh, US representative, who said that we believe that to shake things up, there needs to be some noise. We need to get into a little bit of trouble. I describe my own advocacy as really trying to get into a little bit of trouble as a way to, to um, live out my best version of citizenship, right? Whether it's a citizen of the United States or as from my birth country, um, a citizen of what you, I, I thought was uh, Cameroon. Um, it's important for me to note that um, as citizen, a philosophy of indifference is all that the enemy needs to continue on its version of doing wrong or doing bad things. So within Cameroon uh, currently, there's a sense of weariness and indifference as this war drags out amongst the masses. You see, the war is felt disproportionately on, the, on what is called the Francophone side. They're literally immune and free from the, the, the ravages of the war. It's the theater of war is mainly in my birthplace, Southern Cameroon. So there's a sense of, we are just tired of this. We wanna get on with our lives. And that indifference is what I say, is all the enemy needs to continue. So um, within Cameroon, the construct I describe is one that is fraught with a lot of contradictions. And because of those contradictions, there is also a lot of competing agendas. Um, so you, you would find that for the West, Cameroon is a partner in the fight against Boko Haram that has been conveniently renamed ISIS of West Africa. At the same time, it is being funded to fight terrorism and the US had to sanction it for violating uh, human for human rights abuses within the context of the Sahel and Northern Cameroon. Cameroon is also simultaneously uh, a really uh, resource rich country, rich in all the cash crops in the area, rich, rich in extractive uh, minerals, cobalt, bauxite, gold, copper, but it still participates in the highly indebted and impoverished country debt relief program with the World Bank, while continuously receiving influx of uh, aid and all kinds of funding. As I share in the book, at the time of the book, I don't know where the ranking lies today, Cameroon ranks third from the bottom in terms of gross uh, domestic product, and 158 out of 188 con countries in the corruption index. So, so on the one hand, very rich in resources, on the other hand, very indebted and very poor. Now, the competition comes in uh, as this war is raging on in terms of what um, its bilateral partners are doing. And the way I describe it, I look at it from the standpoint of actors that you would later see when I talk about the peace uh, processes. So here I'm looking at France that never left, is still a colonial power in the country, Great Britain or Britain, Fra uh, France, Britain, Switzerland, uh, China, the US, and a plethora of EU countries. Now you would say every country has friends, right? Uh, on, uh, on the geopolitical level. But within Cameroon, you would find that <laughs> the, the country being oil rich, the, the, the countries that are involved in the, in the uh, extraction industry are the Swiss-based Glencore, for instance, the Russian-based Look Oil, the Scottish oil and gas company Bolivian, uh, uh, U.S. is not to be left out with the Exxon Cameroon Chad pipeline. And of course, France, having been there all along, has Elf Total. Yet, where these resources are found are in the, quote, Anglophone region that today is very impoverished. 
to see that area is a throwback to the 18th century, yet it has all these resources. You may be asking at this point, uh, why is all of this important? Um, I made a reference that at the height of the war, uh, 2017, 2018, the, the BR government signed a 1.5 billion pound liquid nitrogen gas deal with the British New Age African Oil Company. To tell you about this competing agenda, on the one hand, um, these countries are investing in the country, or rather extracting resources. On the other hand, they speak about encouraging the government to solve its problem or their willingness to solve the problem, but yet nothing is actually occurring. So I raise this to say that there, there, are, there is profit in war and there is also um, a, a need to call out these companies, name them and shame them for their lack of, um, uh, for their lip service towards peace and justice and, and the, um, the burden they put on the civilians. Um, so I'll leave that at that and, and move into a sub-thematic area in this, in this section, which is the hyperfragmentation uh, within the frontline movements. So here uh, we are looking at the midst of war, what is going on and how we are going to achieve peace um, in Unravel. I tell I tell my audience most times that to do um, conflict mapping of the situation in Cameroon is not for the faint of heart. Even as I am really deeply immersed both through the work I do and the people I meet along uh, the journey towards seeking peace, I still can't wrap my head around all the different actors both in the diaspora and in Cameroon. So the key takeaway here for me uh, is that as the war rages on, the armed groups, more and more armed groups are entering into the theater of war. There's just a proliferation of parallel militias and the government has, has kind of clued in on this and it's also raising its own parallel militia. So you can't tell. Um, so on the one hand, you can tell the military uh, forces, uh, the former military forces engaging in the war. On the other hand, you can tell the competing militias on, on the Ambazonia side who are engaged in the war, who is the good actor and who's the bad actor, so to speak, if there were ever anything like that. So on page 189, I write that, uh, the masses hold a misguided conception of their leaders as the only one capable of solving the country's problems. But this leadership is clearly broken ar around tribal affiliation, which even further exacerbates the situation. So a tapestry of AM groups has reason after the government cracked down, right, on peaceful protesters in 2017, as I, I related in the first part. You have what is called the eight, uh, Ambazonia Defense Forces, the British Southern Cameroon Restoration Forces, the Southern Cameroon Defense Forces, the Red Dragons, um, the Ambazonia Restoration Forces, the APLM, Sokadev, Egg of Sea, the list goes on and on and on and on. And now everybody in every Hamlet village has a militia and they are looking into the diaspora for funding. Uh, the government is funding its own para militia among civilians and the whole place is a basket case. So um, there is no end in sight now as to how to bring these groups together for either coordination, collaboration, or some sort of messaging. Here's a good place where I think in the interest of time, I should talk about two major groups. Um, one, an armed group uh, describing itself as the Ambazonia Coalition Team. And the reason I'm, I'm uh, making uh, 
uh, talking about this is because I would later become part of that uh, coalition team. Uh, the statement is always, we need a woman because we're going to go into uh, peace negotiation and because of resolution uh, 1325, women are needed. So that's how I am approached and asked to participate in what is called the Ambazonia Coalition Team. Uh, why is this important? Because Ambazonia Coalition Team formed in 2019 at the height of the war, became an umbrella organization that brought together all the political military arm groups for coordination and control, both on the ground and for messaging. And it believed that it had sought the mandate from the people for future negotiations or mediation, depending on how you want to read those two words. The idea around the formation of Amazonia Coalition team was because the war had gotten so bad that there was pressure on the government of Cameroon to enter into dialogue with the armed groups. But the president of Cameroon announced to the world and to the international team that it had nobody to negotiate with. Why? Because of the hyperfragmentation and the incoherency perceived from the armed groups. So ACT was supposed to be that coalition that would stand and deny the international community, as well as the uh, government of Cameroon, that it had no one to negotiate with. And the truth be told, um, when I got in, there was really hope that finally there will be dialogue to end the suffering on the people. But that did not end the fragmentation. Um, it's important to note here, uh, because there has been a lot of criticism on the hyperfragmentation as it still persists till today, that as long as these armed groups, as well as the government, is fragmented, they really it's really hard to achieve peace. But I cite the case of um, uh, the Palestinians because just this past July, uh, 14 Palestinian groups met in Beijing to form what they call a national unity um, body to broker peace with Israel. That's, that's a piece of news that probably is not even out there a lot. And many would ask why China? China's response to that question, which is relevant in the case of Southern Cameroon and, and the criticism about hyperfragmentation, is that China said they recognize um, that uh, to further the Palestinian cause and to bring peace in the Middle East, they needed, um, uh, to bring together all the groups and no one group should be marginalized. So they, they saw the hyperfragmentation as not an impediment, but rather a need to continue to push the agenda for peace, no matter how, uh, as long as they can get some of them to talk together, whether it's Hamas, Fatah, etc. So, and also the fact that they believe in the right to self-determination with even for um, entities without a state. So this is relevant in other contexts, right? But, but the international community seems to push a narrative and deny or absolve themselves from uh, engagement on the account of hyperfragmentation. Because if that were to be said, then neither China nor anybody would be interested in hyperfragmentation in Palestine, in, in Syria, in Yemen, et cetera. So that's why I introduced that concept here of uh, the Palestinian unity movement. But unity has been elusive for the armed groups. Uh, we must be uh, clear about that. Um, so the other group I'd like to talk about on this area of uh, thematic area of hyperfragmentation is, and competition, is that as ACT, Ambazonia Coalition Team, is desperately trying to bring groups under one umbrella. It succeeded at one point to bring about 10 groups together, but there were so many still not wanting to become part. Another group is forming called the Coalition for Dialogue and Negotiation under the auspices of Herman Coleman, the former assistant, uh, not assistant, the former Secretary of State for Africa. 
and their their goal was to advocate for coordination again and also to act as a platform for negotiation so here again we see this concept of competition going on and the um, international community giving itself an off-ramp to say we don't know who to talk to here we have act we have cdn we have these holdouts so who is actually going to get into negotiations if we do uh, have a peace process uh, so the cdn would play would loom large um, in, in this arena of war and peace. Uh, there are those who love it. Uh, there are those who criticize it uh, because they, they claim neutrality or they were agnostic. They did not take a position on independence or federation, et cetera. So they would, they would become what I call the lightning rod <laughs> that fueled a lot of division and collaboration. So the intention they intended, their existence actually created something else. One could say the same for Ambazonia coalition team. <clears throat> and so um, moving along, there are other groups, of course, I can't go into detail because the, there are just so many of them and their complexities can take us all day to treat them here. So what I'll do here is move us, albeit quite rapidly, into what I call the peace process. Uh, thematic area. Um, my inclination is to say the pacification processes, but the, I, I refrain myself from saying that. So now there are three attempts at brokering peace in this country called Cameroon, engaged in war, in, in a seven year war in its Anglophone territories. Uh, the three that I'm going to discuss are the Grand National Dialogue, the Swiss led peace process which I treat in chapter 10 on their activism and mobilization and diplomacy. And the Canadian pre-talks, exploratory talks, some call it exploratory. I personally, because I was involved, I call it full-on negotiation talks. But I know there are people who are going to push back on that, who know uh, as much as I do. Uh, the Canadian talks are not documented uh, in my book because they occurred after the book had been published, but I'll talk about them really briefly and quickly. So, um, so, so the Grand National Dialogue is occurring in Cameroon. Cameroon believes it's an internal civil war and it needs no external intervention. In fact, the, the French uh, ambassador who looms large in all things Cameroon, literally told the world that it, Cameroon does not need anybody to intervene. They're gonna take care of their own problems. Even though from all assessment, it was no longer a domestic crisis, it had moved into being an international crisis. And we can talk about what makes a crisis domestic and what makes it international during a, a discussion period. So there's a part in my book where I, I write that Bia says, let them each have a commission amongst themselves and bring me your recommendation. From that, I will decree into law what is good for the people of NOSO. NOSO, N-O-S-O, is the new name that is given to the people of Southern Cameroons. So on September 30th of, of uh, 2019, uh, the president convenes what it calls the Grand National Dialogue, uh, which has been described as a meeting of party adherents and a few critics. But what I need to let um, you all know is, uh, is, again, this concept of competing agendas, right? Recall that in September of that same year, actually, to be specific, September 5th to 26th, the, the uh, um, Office of the uh, Human Rights uh, Commission had sent a team into Cameroon to assess the human rights violations that were going on there. Remember also that in June of that year, the Swiss government, the Swiss Federation had announced that it had sought and obtained the mandate to prosecute, to mediate the war 
between the government of Cameroon and the armed groups. As the pressure was growing on the government, it simply undercut the Swiss process and went in for what it calls Grand National Dialogue to keep the international community at bay, ostensibly under this concept of complementarity sort of thing. But again, on the one hand, we have the armed groups now believing in full on negotiations and the government playing along with that, but actually going with the Grand National Dialogue. The other thing we want to take out from this se se section is, at the time of me having the Grand National Dialogue, Cameroon had flown into Nigeria and arrested the leaders of the Ambazonian who were meeting at the Nera Hotel. Hence the, um, uh, the concept we now know as the Nera 10 and forcibly returned them, many of whom were refugees in Nigeria, returned them to Cameroon, held them in communicado, later tried them in a, uh, a tri military tribunal and sentenced them some to 15 years to life. All the while wanting to have a dialogue with the M groups to solve the problems in Yaoundé. Um, at this time, the Swiss envoy who believes they are coming in to mediate is told by the government, no, don't come to Yaoundé. We don't want to talk to you because we're trying to solve our own problems by ourselves. So in Unravel, I concluded that the Grand National Dialogue did not really seek to maintain international peace in the region, neither in Cameroon. It was neither a negotiation, no mediation, nor a settlement in resolving the conflict. In my estimation, it was, an, it was a divisionary and diversionary tactic that was intended to diffuse the growing pressure that the BR regime was experiencing and to deceive the international community that it was indeed taking care of the conflict. The Grand National Dialogue just did not address the root causes. What ended out out of the Grand National Dialogue was this concept of, oh, our recommendation is to assign the NOZO, the Anglophone region, special status, meaning because of their Anglo-Saxon heritage, you are special. Therefore, there's some benefits that accrue to you. Um, but this again was a diversionary tactic because that special status is already written into the constitution that governs the country as a whole. They did not need a grand national dialogue to assign it a special status. So you see these contradictions that just keep coming up in, in the construct of Cameroon. It, it neither devolved power in any specificity to those region um, and really did not uh, touch on the root causes. So in the end, even the United Nation resoundingly concluded that the Grand National Dialogue failed and that um, it did not go as far as addressing the problem. And they, for their part, the UN that is, continue to support the Swiss-led process. Um, at this point, I'm going to just relate a little bit about the Swiss led process since I was um, quite involved with it. Again, as I said, I was brought in because they needed a woman. The, for, we take it for granted that um, they couldn't bring women on the field because of um, some people were afraid. Recall that the, the government could reach into other countries and abduct anybody it felt was against it. So um, those participating um, in country were not necessarily immediately brought into the discussion. So I was approached that I needed to come in and participate in what is believed to be future um, talks with Cameroon. And initially I was hesitant. I was afraid for my family 
they had been reprisals, they continue to be reprisals. But after some thought, I, I, I agreed. And so that's how I came to um, participate in what was um, called the Swiss led process that eventually ended at some point. It had a lot of detractors the Swiss leg process. And I really want to tease out some of these because I think they make for interesting read as well as they show us um, this concept of good faith uh, and also a general understanding of what mediators and mediation is supposed to do and how it's supposed to unfold. So I, I talk uh, about this a lot that um, where, where we believe mediators are supposed to be neutral, impartial, and independent, and the mediation process is supposed to be flexible, informal, delicate, private, all those things, all of that occurred. But there was, there was such resistance to the Swiss-led process. Um, I don't know that that's why it failed, but it was more because of the lack of engagement from the government of Cameroon. So very briefly, uh, it was criticized for being opaque and the media picked this and ran with it. Meanwhile, I just told you media mediation processes are supposed to be delicate, somehow informal um, and flexible. There were those who questioned the independence, the neutrality and the trustworthiness of the Swiss and who could blame them, right? Remember, I just talked about the conglomerate Glencore being the primary, uh, um, one of the primary companies in Cameroon engaged in the extractive industries, particularly oil. They have lots of concessions in the uh, Tindy oil fields in the Gulf of Guinea and Real de Rio. I have trouble pronouncing that word. Who could blame that? Bia spent eight months of his life living in Geneva. So there was that suspicion going on. And then at the time that the Swiss announced that they had sought and obtained mandate to indeed to end the crisis in Cameroon, the government of Switzerland was actively negotiating the management of the court. So this, this suspicion just was in the air all around. Others question um, the fact that it had engaged only the Ambazonia coalition team that I was part of to to, to to be the partner at the table to talk with the government of Cameroon. And, and the other groups that held out claimed that those people within ACT were eager to talk to, quote, the white man, but could not sit and dialogue with their own brothers. Other criticisms were that um, the Amazonia coalition team was engaging from a position of weakness, the armed groups did not yet hold and control territory and that um, we needed our own version of grand national dialogue before we could talk to, to uh, the, the government. They, there were complaints about inclusivity, it was not inclusive enough. And then there was this concept of forum shopping. Oh, wow. You had those who were not engaging with the Swiss, actively talking to a European Institute of Peace in Brussels. There were those who were actually uh, lobbying NOREF in Norway, and there were those who were lobbying USIP, US Institute of Peace in the United States. And all of these actors were in the mix. Um, so the landscape became very combative. Um, meanwhile, it was supposed to be the, the platform that would help the people get um, peace. One of the sharpest criticism, though, which no one could argue with at this point in the life of the Swiss process, was, was that while the Ambazonia coalition team, mind you, it, it was made up of armed groups fighting the government, had given a written mandate to the Swiss, there was yet to be a written mandate from Yaoundé. So there were those who say, this is a farce. This is a what they call a holding pattern to diffuse the pressure that the Yaoundé government was feeling and the Swiss were playing along. And so um, they, they wanted to see this written mandate. It didn't matter that in the middle of, of some form of talks, 
the, the Swiss president picked up the phone and called Bia and related back to the, the, the actors that I have just spoke with President Bia. And he is indeed giving me assurances that he will engage full throatedly in the peace process. There was still no belief in this, um, in this process by a vast swath of the population in engaging this war. One other concern that was very troubling was that the Swiss had gone on the, on the theater of war and were picking up the armed groups and ferrying them out of the country ostensibly to train them on human rights and humanitarian law and, and also encouraging them to drop their arms and that created a lot of problems. Um, what I won't do, but I'll just highly cite here, as some of the, as I call it, the, the actual cooking in the kitchen, there were discussions about uh, CBM, so confidence uh, building measures, um, and, and the trading between, again, ostensibly the armed groups and the government, right? They never met in person, uh, though there were meetings by the envoy in Yaoundé and the armed groups in Geneva. At some point, there were discussion on the advancements of CBMs to the point where the armed groups actually did table their own CBM. But the war did not stop. In advance of tabling the CBM, there was this massacre of students in the Mother Francisca Academy where children were slaughtered by unidentified gunmen. And uh, the talks stopped at that point. And, and um, the government of Cameroon blamed the armed groups and ceased uh, engaging to some extent with, with Gunta. But at this point, it was already clear that the government of Cameroon was not going to go on record as the Swiss and the um, M groups have done to tell the world, I am engaged in the Swiss-led process without precondition to address the root causes. They just never did that. And also the fact that they continue to push to the world, even in reports to UNOCA, UNOCA is the UN uh, Office of, uh, for the Central African Republic, uh, briefings that come up most September, that they have held a grand national dialogue they have had recommendations out of the grand national dialogue they are implementing it as part of the process of resolving the, the conflict so there was always this diffusion away and diversion away from what the un has sanctioned as a peace process to re resolve the process uh, the, the conflict and so just four years after uh, announcing it has taken up a uh, mandate to to mediate the swiss envoy gunter announced that he, it was, quote, suspending the peace process. Um, here's a good part where I should simply go into the Canadian exploratory talks. That's not in the book again, because it occurred at the conclusion after I'd written and published uh, Unravel. Uh, very, how am I doing on time, Drea? I actually, um, we're, we're coming to one o'clock. So I would okay. say just if you could wrap up in the next few minutes okay. and then make sure we have enough time for questions. Yeah, thank you. This, I, I knew this was gonna be challenging because of the moving parts. Uh, so I, I fought really hard to see what would be of interest, particularly for first time um, individuals joining me in the second session. So the Canada exploratory talks, in my view, was really uh, negotiations. Canada had always been a sponsor to the Swiss process. So it was the brainchild of the outgoing ambassador, Richard Bill, Bill uh, a Canadian ambassador to Yaoundé, who was a friend of the PM. He, he initiated this. Uh, again, some of the armed groups met in Montreal, in Monte, uh, Montebello, as well as Toronto. In, in quote, secret meetings. Again, I was invited as a woman to participate. Uh, I'll, I'll simply say that it again failed. I won't go into the nuances because there was uh, negotiation on negotiation, backdoor negotiations, hidden negotiations, and again, the hyper-fragmentation amongst the armed groups as to what was going on. Uh, I'll conclude this section by saying that 
um, in my estimation, it was a continuation of a grand national dialogue. Um, the the um, the 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 government of Cameroon still did not negotiate in good faith, even if there was uh, anything to negotiate at that point. Um, it still did not give a written mandate, so there was this continuous concern as to whether there was actually a party to the negotiations or a party to the exploratory talks, depending on how you see it. Um, so you will not see this in the book, so I will not treat it a lot, just to for our purposes uh, that there were, in terms of peace processes, Grand National Dialogue, the Swiss-led peace process, the Canadian Exploratory Talk, um, uh, and my role in it where um, I had to stand out of the meeting for uh, a variety of reasons um, at which towards the end when I was asked to sign up to be the signatory to the declarations and uh, I sought ad I sought advice um, and decided that I was going I was not going to be the person who was going to sign on to those declaration again part of the reason there's a lot more than I, I can share in this format is um, there were a lot of negotiations to which I was not privy. And I was asked to, to carry the face of some of the, uh, the outcomes of that um, meeting. So let me take us in the interest of time to what can we do? Uh, um, moving forward, right? Since we are running short of time. So there really can never be peace unless there's justice. And uh, in other words, we cannot experience peace until at least most of us can believe we are experiencing justice. You can put a, a peace bumper sticker on a car that is called Cameroon all over its territories. It still will not be peaceful. I, I, I talk about this a lot in the first session. So what can we do? We know that the roadmap of peace is through justice and accountability. And we know that the war in, in Southern Cameroon cannot be treated in the abstract, right? There needs to be an independent investigation that includes a full historical account of what happened and what can be done moving forward to prevent future conflict. So just last week, is it like, no, this week, we, we are welcoming the um, Human Rights Commissioner's visit Volker Turk, I believe it's his name, to Cameroon. He endorses the same principles I'm sure all of you would endorse as well, which is that there needs to be an accountability for the crimes that have been committed. It needs to take a victim-centered approach. And uh, we really welcome his, his statements where he said that he's committed again to send a UN team to Amazonia to assess the situation. So the question for us now is what happened to the first investigations, right? So the fact that he's saying he's gonna do that again, that's a good thing. So there's been ample evidence of crimes, um, failing mediation, the two mediation uh, failures. We, we believe that the UN can create a special tribunal for Cameroon, much like it did for Sierra Leone, to look into um, the, the, the war crimes and crimes against humanity. The other things uh, um, we think is that leaving justice to the government is, is accepting that Cameroon has the legal framework to do that kind of work. And I share in Unravel that it does not have the ability to hold itself accountable. And I'll quickly run through lack of transparency, lack of separation of powers, corruption is rampant, there is no clear understanding about um, how the rules and the processes and the law works to a large extent. And there's little confidence from the public that the justice system really would do what it's supposed to do. So finally, um, we always consistently through my organization call on the UN to truly uh, insist on a ceasefire and, and also um, 
that the rights to self-determination is a human rights for all. We are calling on the UN to support a referendum that upholds the right, this right to self-determination for the people of Southern Cameroons. And that one, one other clear possible solution is to allow the people to express their, their, their uh, rights, whether they want to remain in the construct called Cameroon, or they want a federation, or they want all outright separation. So last but not least, as I write in Unravel, I started Unravel because I wanted to seek justice for my daughter. Um, I ended up working for justice for, for daughters that was, could very well be mine in, in the villages and towns that I grew up in Cameroon who are today displaced dead or um, in prison like Sandra and, uh, and Miriam, young, young, um, young girls who are today in adult prisons that I continue to advocate for their release. And so I end by saying that <clears throat> just as the clouds move without bending, even in bending the truth always prevail. And if we rely on the truth by looking at the root causes, we can see our way throughout most wars in the world. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Emma. Um, that was an incredibly detailed account of the, uh, the failures, or as you said, um, the, uh, what was the phrase you used? Uh, 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 not for the faint hearted, um, challenging process of understanding all the conflicting partners, uh, within the conflict in uh, the Southern Cameroons and in Cameroon. Um, I would now like to open up the floor to questions. I already see Gail has her hand up. Um, and I think that's it for the moment. So Gail, uh, please uh, ask a question as usual, uh, two minutes for your comment or question, thanks. Hi, um, I think the, um, the sort of case study of Cameroon raises a dilemma for those of us promoting democratic world federation. Namely, we've been discussing how the difference between federation and confederation is that in a confederation, um, participants can join or leave at will, whereas in a federation, they cannot. And so, for example, when the U.S. changed from a confederation, confederation, uh, confederacy, to a, um, you know, we fought the Civil War to keep the South in the Federation on the basis that the South didn't have the right to secede. So I'm wondering, I mean, that's always, uh, that's always presented a dilemma for me because I thought, well, that doesn't sound democratic. What if a component, uh, you know, in the Federation changes their mind? They don't want to belong anymore because they don't feel that they are treated fairly. I mean, you can say, well, you know, everybody they either processes, procedures, et cetera. And, but we know that there are corruption can, can occur and so on. So I'm wondering what, uh, what you would say about this dilemma, because you're making a strong case that for Cameroon, um, you know, Amazonia has the right to, to secede how how do you address this dilemma? What would you say? Thank you for that question, Gail. Uh, very very good question. It so so you raised the issue of um, federation and confederation. In in the case of Cameroon, it's pretty clear. The country called the Republic of Cameroon seceded. Right, so it it freed the the southern Cameroons to I, I want to use the word reassert its independence and sovereignty on the one hand. And how did it do this? This is where the history of the construct really requires some discernment, some discerning. In uh, 1972, the country broke the federation. Right. In other words, 
it had gotten into a federation that said, no action shall be taken in its article 47, that shall change the form of the state. The government, the larger part of Cameroon, which is 75% Francophone, that had been independent since 1960 and entered its articles of membership into the United Nations and also signed up to the uh, Cairo Declaration, i.e. the AU, which the, the, the predecessor to the Organization of African Union, Constitutive Act, Article 4B, that says, once you achieve independence to st stymie wars, your borders are frozen. So it was in, in itself an independent entity without those territories of Southern Cameroons. Now, having formed that uh, federation, not confederation, uh, it agreed in its own internal instruments that it shall never change the state. So the dominant party that had majority vote broke that agreement and thereby it is argued that it released both entities to assume their unique identity and ostensibly one side claiming its own independence. Now, the changing of the constitution into what is called one and indivisible simply meant that Cameroon has extended its territorial reach into Southern Cameroons through decrees, not the, uh, um, the laws that govern territoriality, whether it's at the level of the United Nations, the African Union, or its own internal instruments. You're right that in confederation, it is more of a lose-lose um, marriage. There is a, there's a deep sense of um, like the Swiss Confederation, European Union, you see Britain seceded out of Brexit. Those kinds of arrangements, you maintain uh, a great degree of sovereignty, uh, but you're binded at other levels and you can kind of come out of it through negotiations without necessarily resorting to war. In the case of Cameroon, it was the, as they call, the false claims of sovereignty dating back to the plebiscite in 1961. So if we can all, I'll end here, if we can all agree that um, the Africa Constitutive Act holds, then Cameroon's boundaries were defined at its time of independence in 1960, such that when Southern Cameroons became independent in 1961, it, it, yes, could enter into a federation and those boundaries were not invaluable at the, that time and still remain invaluable. I hope that answers the question, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for the question. Thank you, Emma, uh, for the answer. Um, next up, I see hands, Alan and then Rebecca, and that's currently it for the moment. So I'll go to Alan first, if that's okay. Thumbs up, Thank Alan, you, uh, 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 I'm Alan Ware, the Program Director for World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. Um, thank you so much for th this incredible dialogue and also for your amazing work. I had a question about the engagement of youth in the peace process in Cameroon. Uh, in 2019, a 14-year-old young woman, Davina Mellon, uh, won or co-won the this prestigious International Children's Peace Prize uh, with Greta Thunberg. You know, Greta got up for her work on climate action. Davina got up for her work in Cameroon on education of youth and de-radicalizing of youth to help with peace processes. I have a question. Is there still safe space for young people like Davina to be working in Cameroon on this, or are some of the threats that you mentioned make it a little too dangerous for youth to work on this? Is the space for youth to work on this? Um, and are there th ways that we can support young people in Cameroon who are working on these issues? Oh, thank you for that, Alan. I do really appreciate the question. I'm not familiar with Davina Mellon. I'm familiar with Greta Turnberry. Turnberg, Turnberry. Uh, so I can't speak to the specific work that she has done. Uh, to answer your question about the space and uh, the, the, the work that youths can do in promoting peace. Um, so 
let me answer this by stating that today there are there are increasing numbers of NGOs engaged in the space for peace building, uh, community engagement, um, and and just for uh, working with the youths because of a number of uh, uh, number of reasons. Uh, the prevailing reason being uh, the 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 aftermath the, the 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 aftermath of the war or the the effects of the war. The other simply because it's a developing country in need of support and the abject poverty. Uh, so as long as organizations come into the space and, and toe the line, right? So uh, justice advocacy is frowned upon a lot. If you're engaged in humanitarian work, you're fine. If you're handing out fish, that's okay. Uh, but if you really want to elevate the voices of the youths to think for themselves, to be what I call activists for good, for justice, they run the risk of arrest, imprisonment, or death. And that's just a fact, because we've seen that in the context of war, we've seen that outside of war. Um, just to give you an example, uh, peaceful protesters uh, protesting anything are summarily arrested, right? So uh, in terms of safe space, it is, uh, if you can see my hand in quotes, it is safe to the extent that you adhere, adhere to whatever guidelines you're given by the government and you stay within the prescribed box of not um, upsetting the apple card. It is an autocratic regime. It operates by decrees and, and, and uh, sanctions. If you can get in and work with youths and keep them within that space of self enrichment, improvements, at a very microeconomic level, you can do that. Um, when it's something that rises and touches the contours of government, you will get a pushback. So short answer, Alan, the space exists. Cameroon is known actually for having a, a lot of NGO working in Cameroon. I mean, I mean, most African countries do. Uh, their work are uh, in the flavor of humanitarian, if I could put that under that large catch bucket, yeah. Um, so yes, youths are making some, um, they're showing some leadership, but the leadership never challenges the status quo. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the best I can offer. Thank you, Emma. You're welcome. Um, I think that our outstanding questioner is Rebecca. Rebecca, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, James. Emma, thank you so, so, so much for spending uh, your valuable time with us over these two sessions. Um, I am recommending your book to everyone I know um, beyond CGS, but Citizens for Global Solutions is particularly privileged to have spent this quality time with you. Um, my question is with regards to the culpability of non-state actors in the ongoing conflict. Um, you mentioned the role that big oil in particular um, and corporate actors have played in prolonging the conflict, contributing to the conflict, um, uh, the, perhaps obstructing peace processes. And while um, we've talked, I think, previously about pathways to justice and accountability, and you mentioned the uh, a special tribunal is one that might look at individual criminal responsibility, state responsibility, there could be the idea of a case before the International Court of Justice, but that still leaves out corporate actors and the role that they have played in this and other conflicts. And so I'm wondering um, if you have any suggestions or recommendations of pathways um, so that that sector um, is not uh, does not uh, succeed with impunity. Um, and there I'll, I will point out that next week I'll be engaged, in the next two weeks I'll be engaged virtually in uh, treaty uh, discussions for an international anti-corruption court. And we're also contemplating, we're also supportive of an international environmental court, knowing the environmental degradation and human degradation that go hand in hand, especially in Cameroon and the Southern Cameroons. So thank you, Emma, again, and I look forward to your discussion. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Your questions are always so insightful. <laughs> they get me to want to just uh, get back on my soapbox. Uh, corporate actors. Oh, wow. So you would know, Rebecca, that um, the U.S. just sanctioned Glencore. Glencore is a major player in the oil industry. As I said, they have concessions, oil concessions in the uh, uh, Tindy oil fields in Rio, Rio de Rail and the Gulf of uh, Guinea. Uh, Gulf of Guinea. And they were found guilty of bribery, uh, all, all other things that have to do with corporate, um, uh, I don't want to say money laundering, in Cameroon, Nigeria, and other countries. So these actors can, in fact, uh, become key player in the justice arena. Why do I say that? They are really uh, what I call non-political arms of nation states. So the interests of states run through these actors. Hence, the K Street is alive and well. And when I say K Streets, I talk about the lobbying industry and the lobbying um, uh, processes in major capital cities. They do this because uh, they want to, to have their not only their political reach, but their economic reach into other countries. In Africa, how do they maintain those riches? It is through something like the um, the libido uh, corridor, if you've heard about it, which is the cobalt belt from DRC through Zambia into Angola. They, they, they and again, brush strokes. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a disclaimer here, right? They go in ostensibly for their interest, and then the 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 selling points are that these would create jobs, it would improve the lives of the youths, and it would create wealth for everybody. I dare you, Rebecca, to go into the Bakasi area, to go into the Kiliwindi area and the Indian zone and see the abject poverty, right? So while the governments may be held to their political views, these actors can come in through these um, economic endeavors for, for the benefit of the, uh, their countries and force the government's uh, policies to be more amenable towards uplifting entire sections of the, of the society. Recall, remember that the middle, middle class in some countries, which is really poor, poor class, is really the only militant between belligerent regimes and poverty. When their interests are threatened, they will, they will go against the government. So when they go in and truly lift up the middle class, the middle class now becomes those key pathways to justice because they will ensure that their interests are not threatened because they, they are accustomed to it. When there is no middle class, because of these corporate actors, you're left with the abject poor and the autocrats. There's no one to act to, 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 to kind of uh, breach that middle. And so you have this uh, a scenario where your justice mechanism really run through people who are willing to take any and all things that takes the burden off of their backs, i.e. war, an autocratic regime that might pay lip services. So my, my, my suggestion to peace um, in, in this area when we're talking about, and I'll come to non-state actor, is that um, these, these multinational corporations are in fact proxies for governments. They can do a lot more in the context of being purveyors of, of peace through the kinds of policies, economic policies that they do engage in in the countries. I talked to you about the Swiss on the one hand <laughs> mediating, on the other hand actively negotiating and perhaps passing, I'm not saying the past envelopes, Glencore did, <laughs> that's why it's, it, it, it was sued by the United States, uh, I guess through universal jurisdiction or something. So, so how do you, how do you explain the fact that it fills the pockets of those who maintain power and power for ill, and at the same time standing up as the Wagner for peace, right? Because they actually told me that that we are the Wagners for peace. Um. So, 
in my view, Rebecca, that's the role that the, the, the corporate actors can play. Now, for the non-state actors, there's a there's a whole um, there, there's a whole compendium on that one that we can talk about. Um, in the in the context of Cameroon, the non-state actors, uh, particularly the the, the, um, the armed groups, are equally complicit in fueling what is what is essentially a very dirty war. Um, so they are they are just as culpable as the government is. Um, to the extent that uh, they will ultimately be partners in peace. In other words, you don't negotiate only with civil society, though they play a role with it in, within that process. You must negotiate with people who have already taken up arms because your intention is to cease is to cease the hostilities and to uh, listen to all uh, parties involved and see how you can come to a negotiation. So there is a role for non-state actors to play in this war um, to the extent that these competing agendas uh, can be used for the force of good. I, I think they, they, they have the ability to also pull the non-state actors together right not not only ngos can do that that's why i say um multinationals are, are proxies to the large extent for policy for government policies in um in in war areas there there is a part in unravel where i say as as long as as long as there is profit to be made in this war there will continue to be these actors that benefit from it. Today, there's a whole cottage industry around the war. Um, there are those who believe that as long as I can get two young men to carry arms or five of them, I can I can get a sponsor somewhere that would sponsor my uh, belligerency. Um, so I, I see, I see finally, Rebecca, I see a potential where the special court for Sierra Leone hybrid model might really play into the scenario in Cameroon. Uh, ultimately, uh, if, if you ask me, the people need to speak on their uh, and express their wishes. They came into a relationship freely. Uh, that relationship was um, was um, broken. Uh, they are being held through uh, what I call a scenario where they find themselves always at a disadvantage. I believe that ultimately a, a solution that asks them to express and get a, a, by way of a referendum might, might work. But in the interim, lasting peace really calls for um, not only justice, but uh, a mechanism for, for rebuilding, for reparation, and for reconciliation. Now, reconciliation can take place across borders as it can take, take place within uh, communities that are, um, are within defined borders. In the case of Cameroon, I think uh, the, the, the hybrid model of Sierra Leone can play, uh, can, play uh, can serve as a good example for, for um, the war in Cameroon. But your your question is quite uh, it's quite a rich and interesting one that I I think we can deal with it um, for the remainder of our time and uh, we still have a lot to talk about. Okay, are there any more questions? I don't see hands raised. Oh, mm -hmm. Rebecca. I think Winston had his hand up, but I'm just also going to point out that in the chat, I've included some materials on the Special Court of Sierra Leone, and I'll also put the Special Court um, for the Central African Republic. Uh, the Special Court for Sierra Leone ha is winding down and is in a residual mechanism. The Special Court for the uh, for CAR is ramping up and has just begun um, prosecution for uh, crimes under domestic penal code as well as international law. But I think Winston had his hand. Winston. Do you have a question or comment? Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. Am I being heard? You are. All right. 
Um, uh, thank Citizens for Global Solution and uh, Emma, whom I had not heard in the first uh, version of this presentation. Uh, my question to you has to do with 1325 resolution and your decision to participate in uh, perhaps a peace process of sort. What about 1325, uh, moral or legal framework, and the internal uh, uh, character of the fragmentation to which you uh, made such uh, frequent allusion, uh, allowed you to conclude that you might be uh, effective? Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for that, Winston. Uh, as with the um, Kamala Waltz um, ticket, they really are moving on a thing called hope. <laughs> hope. Uh, hope is a many beautiful thing, uh, Winston. Uh, and where there's hope, there is the there's the internal uh, desire to do something. Um, if we can only hope a little bit and be filled by that to take action, we might we just might be able to move the needle. Uh, you're right that uh, the hyperfragmentation made the concept of arriving at a negotiated settlement a bit difficult, if not dismal. Um, I have a persistent call on WhatsApp, unfortunately, my apologies. So 13 th at uh, 25 were, was um, the Women, Peace and Security the, um, resolution uh, that said um, women are an integral part of society. Women are usually um, dispro disproportionately impacted by war. Their participation, security, and et cetera, uh, should, be, uh, should be kept in mind. And their participation must also be an integral part of any peace process. Now, um, when when sweet when Switzerland uh, accepted to offer its good offices, it was very clear eyed that there were a multiplicity of of individuals claiming one to have control on the ground, two to be the go to uh, head honcho or leader. But like in all other conflicts, the underbelly comes out to play, right? Whether it's Gaza, there's Fatah, there's Hamas, right? You go to Yemen, you have the same scenario. Syria, you still, you, you're still dealing with the same uh, set of complex actor, whether it's South Sudan. Now, my hope really came from uh, uh, the fact that IGAD, that's the Intergovernmental Agency uh, Developmental Group, who mediated to end the war um, in uh, South Sudan, did not wait for all the parties to sit at the table. In fact, it committed itself to what is called incremental peace agreements. So my hope rose, and I think the people of um, Amazonia were very hopeful that um, th first, there was the recognition that it was not a domestic war. Why? Because when war crimes have been committed, crimes against humanity and uh, genocide wa watch actually saying uh, nine out of the 10 or 12 uh, check boxes have been met, it's a genocide. You have moved from the realm of allowing matters in the hands of one perpetrator to bringing international action to bear because of our common humanity. This is where there's some frustration that when it comes to other wars, it's, it's a snap decision to recognize international character of the crisis and bring international solutions. So moving into a peace process is not a perfect straight line. Um, I, 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 I had this hope, Winston, that finally I can go back to my country of birth. I could go back to that street where once I saw it militarized and, and just breathe the, uh, the, the, the air of my childhood and, and speak with the family that I have there. So that hope fueled me to believe that like in South Sudan, we can, albeit fragmented, engage with the party to a crisis 
and resolve it, even being that we do so as, as in other crises, stepwise. Take Ukraine. Ukraine has had how many peace um, attempts and, and, and in other places. So I, I, I am a big believer of hope, uh, but I believe hope with action can be a force to reckon with. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Emma. Winston, anything else? No, I, 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 I thank you. I, um, I, I was thinking also about the extent to which local women may somewhere be organized and uh, Emma might work with them for the purposes she anticipated. I see. So I do work with some local women um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hedge this a little bit. Uh, going back to your original question within the framework of WPS, Women, Peace and Security. I'm very mindful as I engage with especially a group of uh, local displaced women that I, I, I am conscious of their security and, and the need for protecting them because they are operating in the theater of war. Because any vocal person is seen by autocrats as against them and therefore a target, I'm very sensitive and conscious of my engagement with local actors who ostensibly through my act, through my outreach, might become um, victimized. So um, yes, women on the ground can be a force for change. You really have to understand the ground of this construct called Cameroon to understand that while women have attempted, they can only do so in this nice box that is shaped for them by the government. So there has been a women's movement. They held their own ground nas grand national dialogue where they, they, they called for cessation of hostilities. Um, they made the demands for both sides to put down their, um, their, their arm. But this, this, this women also are either the subjects of threats from both sides, right? Depending on where they lean ideologically, so, so we, we always have that in the back of our minds when we engage our local actors on the ground around a uh, conflict. So um, the short answer, Winston, is that I, through my organization, I engage with um, uh, women on the ground. We work in, in getting uh, children out of jail through their, their pro bono lawyers, little effect because again uh the government is so hell-bent on on arresting people without due process and just keeping them in jail so whatever help we can get to to give women um not only the tools the resources but the protection right to continue to advocate for themselves as victims and also for um, bringing an end to the conflict that's so disproportionate and impacting them is always welcome. Uh, one thing that's near and dear to my heart is the effort that I've been doing over the years to get minors who today have become adults in adult, in, in adult jails released. Until today, they are still being held uh, without due process by the government of Cameroon. Uh, so, uh, Winston, that's what I can offer um, to okay. your last uh, reflections thank, there. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Winston, for the question. Uh, thank you, Emma, for your, um, what can I say, uh, rich, uh, deep analysis. Um, this has been an exceptionally deep dive into the conflict in Cameroon, which is what uh, CGS Book Club is all about. So I thank you for that. Um, I would now like just to very briefly open up to the floor if there are um, any comments or questions on any other business. We usually do this every session, just gives the opportunity to book club members to promote or discuss any other activities they might be involved in that they'd like to bring to the attention of our membership. So does anybody have anything to bring to the table now? I don't see any hands. Oh, Rebecca. 
Um, sure. Well, you or Drea are equally um, able to, to speak to this, but just a plug for some upcoming CGS events that we have. Um, <clears throat> on um, August 21st, we will have a pair of events uh, timed for different time zones that are a continuation of our Impact Coalition series um, on just institutions and the International Court of Justice in partnership with an Impact Coalition on Earth Governance. Um, and this considers pathways to environmental justice through a variety of mechanisms, including the international courts, regional mechanisms, ad hoc tribunals, universal jurisdiction, um, and others. We have one session that is time for the Americas that will be in Spanish. We will translate after the fact, um, and we are currently exploring interpretation options, but in an effort for greater inclusivity and linguistic diversity, we made the decision that the predominant language, perhaps the only language for that one will be in Spanish. And then a, um, a second um, session will be, unfortunately at an, pretty inhospitable time zone live for most of you who are in the United States. Um, I believe it is 1 a.m. on the Eastern, uh, in the East Coast. Um, I know it is 1 a.m. on the East Coast because I am speaking at, the, at that time and I'm setting many, many alarms, um, but that will uh, include um, more case studies from the Asia Pacific region. Um, we also will be keeping you apprised uh, preparations for the Summit of the Future in late September and our next advocacy update in October will deal with the outcomes of the Summit of the Future. And Emma, I hope that you were able to join us with one of our CGS passes for action days. Um, we understand that the registration for those will open um, next week and CGS has a limited number of slots and we would be honored if you were interested in participating on our roster. And then I know what Alan is going to pitch, so I'll leave it to him to do so. Thank you, Rebecca. I look forward to that. Alan? Uh, thanks, Rebecca. So Citizens for Global Solutions is co-sponsored with World Federalist Movement and some of the other partners in a follow-up event to the Non-Proliferation Treaty Preparatory Conference, which was two weeks on nuclear risk reduction and disarmament in New York. So on Monday, we have the follow-up event. We will be reporting what were some of the things we were calling on the governments to do, what sort of traction was it getting, and how will some of these proposals take from the NPT through to the UN Summit of the Future. So I, I put the information in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you, Alan. Um, that only leaves me, I believe, to tell you about the next session of Book Club, which will be on the 14th of September. We will be starting with The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's wartime quest to build one world, um, a return to our roots um, of world federalism. Um, that's by Don, uh, the Dr. Samuel Zip. The second session to mark... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think we have an introduction from a baby there. Um, yeah. Interruption. I'll just mute that. Um, assuming everything is okay. So just to close, um, on, then on the second session will be on October 12th. So mark that for your diaries. It will be an exciting read and an, uh, I'm sure a great pair of sessions. Um, if you are new to book club and you would like to be uh, kept informed about uh, future sessions and books that we will read, please drop your uh, email in the chat right now. Um, I am dropping in the chat a link to our uh, book club programs page so you can keep yourself updated and informed. Uh, I believe that is time. So I will just once again say thank you for, uh, to Emma for her time um, and her commitment uh, to this incredible cause. Uh, Rebecca, I see waving fingers, so perhaps you would also like to... Yes, well, in addition to thanking Emma once again, if there are any recommendations or suggestions for future book clubs, um, you know how to reach us, I hope. Um, and if you are an author yourself, um, Winston, looking at you, I'm familiar with your work, um, we would welcome you to join us for future sessions. Yes, I, I have a recent book on uh, abolishing war, and uh, I would be delighted to share its contents, yes. Wonderful. Well, in that Thank case, you. we will reach out to you, Winston, uh, in follow-up. Yes. Um, I see. Thank you, uh, Nadine, for dropping your email in the chat. We will add you to the mailing list. Uh, with that, I will say thank you. Goodbye. Have a great Saturday. 
uh, wherever you may be. And uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all. Bye.